Hey folks, uh, today's uh, hearing of the Minnesota Senate Agricultural Broadband and Rural Development Committee for Wednesday, February 21st is now in session. Uh, great to see so many people here today. We got some really cool people to hear from and some interesting things to hear about. Today, uh, our friends at the Sugar Beet Growers will be here to visit with us and tell us a little bit about everything Sugar Beet. Uh, then we will uh, hear an update from the Office of Broadband Development then a state of dairy presentation by Minnesota Milk, and then the Dairy Development and Profitability Enhancement Program presentation by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. That's our agenda for today. Our first order of business is a Sugar Beet Growers Day at the Capitol. Uh, we have uh, Harrison Weber and Nate Hultgren who will be talking with us. Uh, gentlemen, if you could state your name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, my name is Harrison Weber. I'm the executive director of the Red River Valley Sugar Beet Growers Association. With me is uh, Nate Holtgren, a sugar beet grower and current chairman of the board for the Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Co-op. And then I also have some friends uh, behind me here. We got uh, a number of sugar beet growers uh, on the hill today uh, representing the three farmer-owned co-ops of American Crystal Sugar, Mindac Farmers Co-op, and uh, Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Co-op. So again, Mr. Chairman, I just thank you for the opportunity to present about sugar beets here. Uh, we've, we've had a great relationship with you over the last couple of years and, and certainly appreciative of, of the time you've, you've given us here today. So um, in case anybody hasn't seen a sugar beet, uh, it's not the red beet that we have in a garden, okay? Um, it is a sugar beet. It, it grows underground. It's a root crop. It's, it's primarily uh, comprised of uh, sugar and then water and then also some pulp. And that's it. And, and what we're doing with this, with this crop is we are extracting the sucrose from this crop. In fact, the sucrose that we're extracting from the sugar beet is the exact same sucrose that you consume in a wide variety, if not all, uh, various vegetables or fruits that you'd be eating. So it's the exact same sucrose that's in an apple, that's in an orange, that's in cashews, you name it. It's the same exact stuff. There's, it's chemically indistinguishable. In fact, we could, if we could grow orange trees here in Minnesota, we could extract the sugar from oranges. We don't because there's not enough sucrose in the oranges to economically and viably uh, extract that on a commercial scale. Just sugar beets and sugar cane is what we do here in the United States. Where is sugar produced throughout the United States? We have. Uh, we, we get sugar from two crops, cane and beet. Cane is grown in Florida, Louisiana, Texas, and then sugar beets is raised uh, primarily in the northern part of the United States. Uh, this map represents the concentration of acres of sugar production. So basically the lighter shade, or the darker the shade, the more concentrated it is. So you can see a heavy concentration down in Louisiana of sugar cane. And then also up in Minnesota, North Dakota. Minnesota, North Dakota is the, the largest concentration of, of beet acreage uh, and, and sugar beet production. In fact, our three farmer-owned co-ops supply uh, about one-third of our domestic sugar needs here in the United States. And Minnesota is the largest sugar beet growing state in the United States. Uh, other thing to note here, um, I do have the, the total acres, 1.1 million acres of sugar beets, 900,000 acres of, of sugar cane. So only 2 million acres of, of sugar production in the United States, relatively small compared to Corn, I think we got 90 million acres of corn, 90 million acres of soybeans, about 50 million acres of wheat. Uh, there's only 2 million acres of sugar, beet produ or sugar production in the United States. So relatively small crop, but, but still a big impact. Uh, zooming in on our growing region here, these are the three farmer-owned co-ops that are represented, American Crystal, Mindac, and Southern Min, and you can kind of see uh, the various growing regions. Also identified on the map is our seven factories, uh, if we, we uh, get technical here, and on the Minnesota side of the river, we got East Grand Forks, Crookston, Moorhead, uh, and Renville there uh, for our, our Minnesota factories, but collectively there are seven, seven factories that we process sugar beets uh, into. Let's talk about the regional economic impact of, of sugar beets in our, in our region. Uh, it's really a, a driving factor for us up in, especially northwest Minnesota. It's the difference maker uh, in our rural towns. It's the difference maker for the, the tire shop, the tire repairman, the, uh, the, the seed salesman, the crop insurance adjuster, the adjuster, the insurance salesman, the banker. I mean, everything is, is really driven around sugar in, in far northwest Minnesota. We do have an economic impact of over $6 billion uh, in our region, and we're associated with 16,000 jobs. And we are proud to uh, su 
proud to partner with our strong domestic union labor workforce to keep our factories uh, running efficiently and effectively. And then also, it's always uh, we, we also good to note we do generate uh, nearly two hundred million dollars in revenue for uh, for state and local government uh, through taxes and stuff. So that's a that's a great thing as well. Uh, I've mentioned this a couple times, but I like to emphasize it. We are 100% farmer owned. The entire sugar beet industry, in fact, is 100% farmer owned. We do not have any outside investors. We do not have, uh, we're not publicly traded. Um, you have got to be a farmer to be a member of our, of our co-op. And, and there's no other industry that I know of that is like that. Um, we are vertically integrated, so we, you know, own our co-ops as farmers from putting the seed in the ground all the way to that bag of sugar that's on the grocery store shelf. Um, we, we, we own the supply chain through that and that's all paid 100% by us as farmers. Um, roughly 3,500 of us uh, collectively own small pieces of, of those, of those co-ops, of our respective co-ops. So I'm a very small part owner of American Crystal, Nate is a very small part owner of Southern Men, and then my counterparts in the back are, are also small owners of their respective uh, uh, co-ops. I mentioned this before, but we, we do collectively account for 25 to upwards of a third of our domestic sugar needs. That's both cane and beet. So I think it's important to note that things that happen in Minnesota not only impact our, your constituents here in Minnesota, but also uh, really people across the entire United States. Whether that's weather impacts, whether that's policy, you name it, if something happens here in Minnesota, it's truly impacting our entire supply chain uh, as it relates to sugar. And then something uh, of interest here, we, I put on there, uh, obligation to plant sugar beets. This is much, much different than corn, soybeans, and wheat. As farmer-owned co-op, we don't have, and I'll call it a luxury, we don't have the luxury of being able to decide whether we want to plant more or less sugar beets based on the market or based on weather conditions. We are obligated as shareholders of our, of our respective co-ops to plant and deliver those sugar beets. And so when the price is in the, in the tank, Doggone it, we still got to go out there and plant that crop. You know, we might be able to adjust a little bit here and there, but it's not like we can make a, a, you know, a, a few hundred acre swing uh, from year to year based on weather conditions or based on prices. So that's something very, very unique to our, to our industry as well. I'll just run you through planting here, or run you through the kind of the growing season. Start with planting. As a sugar beet producer, planting is a priority. Um, it, it usually takes about a week to 10 days to complete, depending on when we get into the field. Uh, we are 100% Roundup ready uh, technology use in, in the sugar beet industry. I don't know of any other um, commodity that is 100% using GMO technology. Uh, and so with that, you know, treated seeds is very, very important to us. That's a very critical um, tool for us to use. Uh, as you can see, this gentleman is holding a treated beet seed uh, in his hand there. And we really use the, the, that technology to protect that beet until it gets large enough to, to stand on its own free will, basically. And I just put a couple of notes here on how we apply that, uh, that, that pesticide. We use, uh, it's treated at the seed facility. We use what's called loss and weight measurement to exactly apply whatever product uh, we may be putting on there. And then also to double check what was put on there, we use high performance liquid chromatography. And that's a lot of words and, and bigger words than I'm used to, but it's really a, a, an analytical chemistry technique that, that it can exactly quantify, and if there's any scientists in the room, they could confirm this with me, but it's, it exactly quantifies what product uh, was put on there. And if anything's out of spec, it gets you know, brought back and, and it never gets distributed. So just, just important for everybody to know. Uh, talk about the growing season, you know, uh, spraying, use access to, to various tools is, is very important to us. You know, we're, we're monitoring various weeds, disease, pests all the time. Timing is a critical. There's a certain pest called sugar beet root maggot that can literally wipe out a sugar beet field in maybe three, four days. And so we're con continuously monitoring our fields. At all of our co-ops, we have field staff, egg staff uh, that are basically agronomists only for us as sugar beet growers. So they're in charge of monitoring about maybe 10,000 acres, 15,000 acres roughly, with a number of different growers underneath them. And there are our, uh, our personal agronomists, which is very neat, so we, we have access to that. We're using technology, you guys have all heard about this, you know, the GPS, the row shutoffs. Now new, coming new to the market is a technology called Sea and Spray, that's a branded product, I think, by John Deere. Um, which I believe is going to be commercially adopted within the next five years, probably maybe seven years. And I got an example of, of, of a couple of things here of what we're doing. Um, 
on the top picture there, I have the word good, and I can't remember what copy you guys might have, but if we look on the picture here, we have good. That, you know, that's a very common scene of what we're, what we're doing out in the countryside. We have an enclosed cab on a self-propelled sprayer. He's using that sea and spray technology where you can see the nozzle, only certain nozzles are on at a certain time, meaning it's only spraying that chemical on the identified weed and not anywhere else. Uh, and, and we have filters in the cab. You know, when he has to handle products, he's wearing gloves and he's wearing uh, goggles. Now to compare that with the, uh, the picture on the, the bottom side, this came across my Facebook feed and I grabbed a snapshot of it um, because I thought it just illustrated a, a very critical point. You know, in Minnesota and across the United States, we, have, we do have regulations and, and you know, some regulation is good. We have the EPA, we have MPCA, you know, we have labels, we trust the science and we're all about safety. And this, this particular picture, um, I'm not sure what country it was, but I know it, it was not in the United States. And this individual is spraying something uh, and using what looks like to me in the video, it was kind of like a fire hose. It was going back and forth. And I don't know what product he was spraying, but I don't, we, there's no label for that in the United States. We don't allow anything like that, and nor would we want to. So I think it just illustrates the examples of some of the technology we're using compared to other growing uh, regions across the, the, the globe. Uh, moving into uh, pre-pile and into harvest, we uh, start taking harvest or start harvesting our sugar beets around August 15th. This allows for a gradual startup of, of our factories and also to get sugar onto the market for our consumers. Um, we uh, operate seven factories up and down the uh, Minnesota, North Dakota. We have about 50 receiving stations between our three cooperatives, which are called outside uh, piling sites where we store the beets. And then, and then with that, 150 storage piles. And, and I'll give you a picture of it later on here. Um, our main harvest runs from October 1st for 24 hours a day, for 10 days to two weeks. And I put in parentheses there, hopefully, uh, that's if Mother Nature cooperates. And so it's arguably the largest movement of freight in the entire world uh, right here in our backyard. We do process sugar then 24-7 from basically mid to late August all the way into uh, mid-May. It's about 260 days is our, is our processing campaign here. Uh, there's the first step. I uh, just want to show you some of the specialized equipment that can only be used in sugar production. This is called the beet topper. Uh, it's basically the largest industrial mower you've ever seen. Um, that particular brand, Amity, is actually built and manufactured in Fargo, North Dakota. There's a number of um, equipment, sugar beet specific equipment that is produced in our region. Alloway is another company that's produced there. Uh, H&S Beet Carts in uh, Stephen, Minnesota, or Warren, Minnesota. Uh, Valley Beet Cart in Dwight, North Dakota, right south of Fargo. So a number of, of equipment manufacturers uh, in our region as well. Second step is lifting the beets. We literally pluck them or lift them out of the ground. Um, this machine is called a lifter. Unlike a combine where we can make a round or even two and have um, our product in the hopper, we can't go more than, uh, hopefully we can't go more than maybe 50 yards without that tank filling up. So we have to have a semi or a, or a beet cart, similar to a grain cart, right next to us at all, at all times to be unloading that product. Uh, we do rely heavily on, on semi-transportation as well as triaxles uh, to transport then the beets to the piling site or straight to the factory. This is just a picture of a, of a common scene across uh, our region. As I mentioned, we have 50 of these locations where there might be three or four uh, sugar beet piles, but we have 50 locations. You might have driven uh, past one and see them, seen this, but this is where we store beets throughout the winter. Um, we do force air, similar to maybe a grain bin where you force air to keep the beets, uh, keep the grain in condition. We force air underneath them to keep the beets in condition, and we'll store them uh, all the way until uh, the factory can can accept them or, or can process them into pure white granulated sugar. When you get out of uh, the metro area and you get up towards the Red River Valley, it's extremely flat up there. I see Senator Kupek uh, laughing. Uh, we don't have a lot of topography up there, and so we, we joke we make our own mountains, and, and the mountains are the sugar beet piles. And they really are uh, small mountains. Uh, just to put it in perspective, it's about the size of a football field and then 26 feet high. And it's a, it's a massive amount of volume there, but that's just a, a picture there. Those are light towers next to it, and you can see the, the big fans that we force, under, force air through them. Uh, what do we sell? Granulated sugar, powdered sugar, brown sugar. We package everything from your single serving that you put in a coffee all the way up to rail car, uh, full worth of sugar to our industrial users. You know, we package for 
each and every brand I have on there, 30 plus different consumer brands. If you're buying a brand at Target or Walmart or, or whatever, it's probably, a, no doubtedly, it's, it's one of our three co-op sugars, especially if you're buying it in this part of the country. Uh, also, a part of our, some of our byproducts, beet pulp certainly goes to cattle, uh, cattle feed and dairy feed. I, my, I see my milk friends here. Uh, they like uh, the, the beet pulp. Molasses, betaine, and, and raffinate. And one, one interesting thing of raffinate, I think we're actually using that on uh, some of our roads for de-icing in, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list of, of our uh, customers, but a lot of familiar brands to, to many of you. And so just to illustrate the point that, you know, we're, we're selling, if they're using sugar in their product, uh, they're, get, they're either getting it from, from us or they're at least getting a bid from us. But uh, we're, we're more likely than not doing, we are doing business with them. Uh, a lot of familiar names up there. Similarly, on the retail side of things, when you're going to the grocery store, um, you might recognize some of, the, some of these places you might shop at. And you, they might have their own branded bag of sugar. Again, more likely than not, it's coming from, especially in this part of the country, it's coming from us. If you're buying cane sugar, it didn't come from us. But that's OK if you do. Uh, there is no chemical difference between those two. Uh, some of our issues, you know, freight movement is, uh, is a big deal. We kind of talked about that, illustrated uh, our harvest. Um, we are limited by Mother Nature, 10 days to two weeks, arguably the largest movement of freight in the world. Nobody's challenged me on that, so I'm going to keep rolling with that talking point. So if you know somewhere that they, they move, I think it's about 20 million tons worth of product that gets moved in about 10 days, two weeks. So it's a, it's a substantial movement of freight. Uh, pesticide use. Um, I mentioned 1.1 million acres. Compare that to, to some of our other commodity friends. Industry doesn't look at sugar beets and is like, oh yeah, there's a lot of acres there. We're going to make a, a product for them. We're kind of Oh well, let's make it for this commodity, and oh, it also works for sugar, and that's great, you know. And that's so access to to our current tools is very, very important to us. Factories, we're literally literally investing north of a hundred million dollars collectively each year uh, in our in our factories up and down the valley to to lessen our footprint, improve our efficiencies at our factories. But those issues are are important, you know. Uh, treated seed, we we discussed that. Everybody's very much aware of, of the advantages that that brings us. Uh, labor. We need 15, this is back the napkin farmer math, but 15, 16,000 people on the farm to get our crop in. That's truck drivers, that's tractor drivers, that's, that's beet toppers, you name it. So if any of you are looking for a job, we'd love to have you come drive beet truck for us sometime. Um, and then I'll just, lastly, I'll just end with this, and just as a reminder, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, and everything that happens in, the, in, our, in our state here in Minnesota, you know, whether it's weather, whether it's policies, you name it, it truly does impact our entire nation's supply chain. So it's not just on our farms, it's not just our rural communities, it's not just our co-ops, it's not just your constituents, but because of what we're doing here at, with our three farmer-owned co-ops, it truly does impact uh, all of the United States citizens. So. And lastly, just say no to the imposter. Don't use the fake stuff. Stick to the real stuff. So with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, we'll yield to questions. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Uh, questions, comments from members? Senator Kunish. Um, thanks for sharing all this incredible information. I'm just wondering with the unusual winter that we've had and the fact that there's like no snow on the ground um, and that means a couple of things. So my question is, do you, would you anticipate that you could plant early and have a more successful season? Could, I, don't know, I don't know how sugar beets work, if you can have two seasons in a year like this. And then is there going to be enough moisture in the ground for the beets this year, or is that going to be a problem? Yeah, so I guess to Mr. start Hulker. with, we're probably one of the few people in Minnesota that actually hate this weather. For those storage piles that Harrison had on a slide, we really like cool weather to store them. So the, the warm winter is always a threat to us, even though we all like it. But uh, getting back to your question about planting dates and planting earlier, so federal crop insurance, which most of our growers have, has a, a limit on the date for how early you can plant, usually around April 10th, to where if you plant before that, you won't have coverage for your crop if they freeze. And so most guys abide by that. Okay. Um, as far as getting two crops in a season, it's, it's long enough, you know, we're stretching into October where we'll never be able to get two crops even if we do plant early. Mm -hmm. So that won't be a possibility. Uh, your other question was about moisture in the ground. And last year was kind of a proving point for our sugar beet crop on how resilient they are. 
Um, if we can get them up and growing, you know, when they're really small, that's why we need those seed treatments, but when they're really small, they're really easy to kill, but once a sugar beet gets bigger than your hand, you almost can't kill it. And last year, we only had a couple of inches of rain up and down the valley, and we had some tremendous beet crops. So I think a lot of that is biotech. The seed is stronger, the plants are stronger, and able to deal with more weather events than they used to do 20 years ago. So we got a fantastic crop last year with very little rain. We'd like to see some more rain to charge the soil here this spring before we start planting, but you know we got a few inches of rain this winter that actually soaked in because the ground wasn't very frozen. Right. So that will help us, but certainly some snow would have been welcome going yeah. into the spring planting season. I bet. We might still get it yet. Yeah. Just one more question. I, it's really great that you know the farms are 100% family owned. That's really you know kind of heartwarming, um, but it sounds like you have really seasonal needs for labor, as you said in, at the end. Well, you said it's 16,400 jobs, but just to get that uh, harvest in, you need 15,000 people. Are you experiencing a major shortage? Do you have kind of like a regular, I don't know if it's a migrant population or seasonal workers that you depend on? And, and is that, has, has that been dependable or is that going to be a big problem? Mr. Yeah. Milgren. Yeah, go ahead. It's still a, it's an issue for us all the time to find good labor. And it's more of an issue of ability than it is numbers of people. We've got people taking vacation from work to come out and drive trucks for us. People kind of enjoy it, like playing cowboy, driving truck. Um, we recruit all the family members we can. There's some folks that are utilizing the H-2A worker program. Whenever they can't get enough labor source from their community, they're going outside to get it. And that's very temporary in nature. Um, I'll be honest, a lot of the people that come out and work for us are semi-retired or retired folks, and so that population continues to age, and so we're looking for more options there. So I would say that's probably one of the number one concerns of beet growers going into the fall harvest still is trying to find that labor for driving trucks and tractors. Mm -hmm. yeah. Members, any other questions or comments for our friends? Mr. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, do you, uh, or does the sugar beet industry have any organic farmers in the sugar beet industry? Mr. Weber? N not in the sugar beet industry. Uh, there is some organic cane sugar that gets sold. Uh, there are, I'm not sure how the right way to put it, there, we're, we're not sure if it really is organic or not, but that, that is being brought into the United States, uh, but not in the beet side. There's no organic uh, uh, beets that are grown. No, and the beet side is 100% GMO uh, Roundup Ready technology. Senator Anderson. Senator Kupek. Sure. I, I'm, I'm just going to back because uh, I'm curious about this. On the piling side, obviously it has been a very warm uh, winter. Uh, have we seen, you know, are you expecting any kind of losses on that in the piling because it, it hasn't been cold enough to be the outdoor freezer? Mr. Hulkin. Yeah, we do. When we have a winter this warm, um, what will end up happening is those beets on the outside layer, when they're absorbing sunlight and they're constantly freezing and thawing every day, that is a problem. It's like when you put a tomato in the freezer and then you set it out on your counter, it just turns to mush, right? And a sugar beet will do the same thing when it freezes and thaws a lot. So this is not good for the outsides of our piles. We put a high quality beet into the pile this year. It was very clean. And I think that's helping us get by. But no, it is a risk for us. And um, We'll see our, our processing capabilities dwindle as the season goes along. We'll become, it, it adds more color to the mix, so we have to process it more to try and get that color out of it when we have these degraded beets from the heat. So we've got ways to deal with it. The ventilation is our number one ally, trying to get them cooled down. But, yeah. Mr. Weber? Yeah, I'd just add, you know, one thing we try to do to mitigate that challenge is, is we will uh, actually put a layer of insulation, insulation blanket on top of those beets. Uh, to help mitigate that, to help them uh, stay in good condition. We'll force air through them when the temperatures uh, allow us to, and then we'll put a, uh, a blanket on top of that to keep the cold in and the heat out until the factory's ready to, uh, to process. And then also, we do have some sheds, they're massive, massive sheds that are indoor sheds. Uh, those will be our last beats that we will, we will pull from, and those will stay in good condition for the longest time. But it is a, it is a, a worry. Uh, let's uh, have that question in another month, and then I could maybe have a better answer for you. We're, we're right in the, 
the time of finding things out. Also, I had nobody else in the world doing this, so we're learning, we're learning here uh, in Minnesota. There's nobody else that does storage like we do in the world on sugar beets. So. Uh, Senator Kupek? Sure. And then uh, on, just on the hauling side, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm just wondering, is there anything, you know, regulation-wise from you would like from, you know, lawmakers or anything we can do uh, in terms of on the hauling side or, or any other aspect, you know, of the process that we could help out in some way? Mr. Weber, you're smiling. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Kupek, you know, there, there are challenges um, with our limited harvest window. There are times, there's a lot of stress at play. There are a lot of times when we may feel um, we can have a target on our back because we are the largest movement of freight in the world. Um, and so there might be things that we can do to, to work with law enforcement, um, not asking us to, to allow us to break the law. Um, we actively encourage uh, law, uh, the state patrol to to be actively patrolling up and down uh, the valley. We want them out there. We want them pulling over the the guys that are speeding, not using their blinkers, not using the seatbelt, because those folks are out there. We want them to 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 be taking care of those those issues. But you know, there there are conversations. I think that some serious conversations that we do need to have uh, about our industry uh, moving forward on that issue. Definitely, Senator Kubek. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm always it's. Thrilling uh, because I, I I don't feel like I do a very good job sometimes explaining to my colleagues the sugar beet industry. So uh, it's very nice to have you here and, and present this. So thanks for being here today. Thank you. Well, and I do want to say briefly that you have a, a wonderful advocate in Senator Robert Krupek. Um, he uh, loves the sugar beet. Uh, and I also wanted to thank you personally and publicly for having us out there and hosting us when the committee came out there. Um, and also to tell that anecdote of just how much pride Senator Krupek had when we were at the giant sugar beet statue. Uh, <laughs> so I, I hope you appreciate his hard work on your behalf. Uh, Senator Dames, we had a question. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Not a question, just a comment. I just want to thank Sugar Beet Growers for being here today and for what you folks do. Uh, in my district, uh, sugar beets are a big deal, and we have a lot of growers out there, and it's another crop that they can put into their crop rotation, and uh, we certainly appreciate what it does for our local economy. So thank you very much for what you do. We appreciate it, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thanks again to our, our, our friends, Mr. Weber and Mr. Hulkren, for your presentation. Um, oh, uh, briefly, if you could, uh, Senator Dornick. I'm sorry. I don't hardly ever talk. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It was very, uh, very helpful. I mean, I'm in southern Minnesota, so we got corn and soybeans, and so it was, it was nice to hear that. I just had a quick question on with the, the part-time labor that you have, 15,000 people for that harvest, and you know we passed the law last year about earn sick and safe. I was just wondering, that's gotta be very complicated and difficult, um, thinking that would be a great exemption for maybe guys like you, but I'm just wondering how that's implemented and how are you going to uh, be able to navigate through that? Yeah, Mr. Weber? Uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Chairman, members, can we, are you referencing the, the paid sick Sick and leave time? Is that You're in sick and safe, the one that sick started. Yeah, so there is no exemption for us. So certainly all of us sitting behind here, I mean, we, we need to comply with that. That would be uh, that'd be definitely welcomed uh, as the egg community and sugar beet growers to, to find an exemption for agriculture. Our harvest is uh, to two weeks, and we need to come, we're, you know, need, required to comply with that, that law now here in Minnesota. All right, thank you. The only other question real quick is, Mr. Chair? That's okay. Senator Dornick, sure. Uh, is just, the, you know, in corn, soybeans, always, and hogs, and many other things are really uh, volatile in your pricing. How is it for sugar beets? Are you guys uh, dealing with that too, or is it more of a firm uh, pricing yeah. per year? Mr. Orr? Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, we have what's called the U.S. Sugar Program, and we could spend a couple hours discussing that at the federal level. Um, we have a program that limits the amount of foreign subsidized sugar imports that come into our country. And that's a program that's at the federal level and we fight each and every day to, to maintain that, that uh, program. That takes out the lows. It also definitely puts a cap on the highs. Uh, it keeps our prices reasonable for consumers and for food manufacturers. So in general, I will say uh, there is less volatility than other crops. 
still volatile. Still, I mean, we were coming off a decade of, generally speaking, very poor sugar prices. This year has been, uh, it was a great year on prices, but it's been a decade since we've, since we've seen prices uh, that have been advantageous for us. So. All right, thank you. Thank Senator you, Mr. Chair. Thank you again, gentlemen. You're uh, free to go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, our next presentation is an update from the Office of Broadband Development. Uh, so, Ms. Mackey, if you would please, uh, would you uh, assume the table? And we also have a special guest, special guest star uh, with uh, uh, our friend Indeed from Deed, uh, Daryl mm -hmm. Dannon. If you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. All right, well, good afternoon. My name is Bree Mackey, and I'm the Executive Director at the Office of Broadband Development. And my name is Daryl Dannon, and I am the Government Relations Director at DEED. Well, once again, thank you for the opportunity to come before you and share the incredible work that our team at the Office of Broadband has done over the course of the last year. As a reminder, um, our office, um, runs on the policy framework as shown above. So we do have statutory goals, which are the 100 by 20 by 2026. We do have the Office of Broadband Development, and we do support the Governor's Task Force on Broadband as well. Since 2008, the state has had a robust mapping program, and we continue to do updates to those maps twice a year. So the last time that it was updated was in November. And then also we have tools in our tool belts, thanks to many of you here. Um, we have the infrastructure grant programs, um, which we'll talk about later, as well as the digital equity work that we are doing. Uh, so for many of you who have been around broadband for a long time, you probably remember when the office had two, maybe three folks working there. And with all the uh, additional federal and state dollars we've received, our team has grown quite a bit. Um, what I love a lot about this slide is the dots on the map indicate where we are located across the state. So we live and work in communities that also have struggles with broadband um, and are actively working to solve, solve those issues. I do like to point out the Southeast Minnesota Winona County because that is my home district. All right, so why are we continuing to do this work? Where are the unmet needs? So um, listed below, you can see the November 2020 to mapping uh, data and up above to highlight that that has significantly, in our opinion, have gone down each year and that is a testament that these programs are working, um, that the providers that are applying for these grant dollars um, as well as private investment are doing the hard work to reach all the unserved and underserved locations within our state. Um, just, I know it's hard to see on the screen, but the red areas are the unserved, the purple areas um, are uh, underserved, and then the green are wire line, or, or wireless, not wire lined areas in the state. So um, this is also available in our annual report, and certainly the slides will be made available to all of you. I do know that it's a little difficult to see, but gives you a snapshot of the state and where we are at. All right, so to highlight some of that work, as I indicated, each year we do do a report and that is available online and happy to get that to all of you. And we'll highlight just a couple things on this slide and then we're gonna talk in more detail later in, um, in my presentation. Um, but one thing, again, we do do updated maps every year and those are available. We also have a great portal online that residents and businesses can go on and look. And I also want to point out that we work directly with constituents across the state. And I actually, um, we have listed 400 constituents. I would say that's much more when you talk about the line extension program. We're working with individual businesses and residents uh, to really understand what the broadband they have available, uh, where their needs are unmet, and walk them through the processes. Also like to point out that we do uh, have been doing our tribal consultations as well. So really proud of the work that our team is doing. 
All right, so in review, um, last year, uh, thank you all again for your continued support, uh, but the legislature did appropriate $100 million over the biennium. Uh, right now, we are in grant round nine, very close to making uh, those awards soon. Um, 30 million in our traditional border to border and 20 million in the low population density program. The only technical change that was created last year was increasing our border to border grant awards from $5 million to $10 million. All right, so with this slide, again, I know it's, it's quite small, but there's a lot of information on that. But what I do like to, to point out there is way on the right, it shows the number of locations served over the course of the last eight grant rounds. And that is over 100,000 homes and businesses across the state that we have impacted um, their economic development, their, their lives, their education, all of the things that we do. And um, these dollars amount add up to around $237 million in investment. Again, that does not account for the $100 million that was appropriated last year. All right, so as I mentioned, grant round nine um, had 50 million available. And with that, I just wanna point out so that you're aware of what is still being requested and the needs. So we had 38 applications for our traditional border to border program, um, which, the request itself through all the applications was over $65 million. So oversubscribed uh, in the requests. And then also to highlight the low population, uh, low density population had 31 applications uh, for that $20 million and the request was over $85 million um, from our grant requests. So what comes next is grant round 10. So again, another 50 million, which will be split up accordingly with the 30 million and then the 20 million. We hope to launch that next grant round as soon as possible after we make our awards for grant round nines. State funds really need to be awarded so that we know all the locations that will be served prior to our bead unserved and underserved required list in our final proposal and our final subgrantee selection uh, that we're required to do with the federal dollars. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. All right, so the line extension program, as a reminder, was uh, during the 2022 legislative session. And this program is really uh, to award grants for an extension of existing broadband infrastructure that didn't reach the home or business. So um, that cost can be quite high. Um, and so we allow up to $25,000 per passing in that program. As a reminder, that is a self-registered program. So uh, individual landowners, residents, and businesses go on and self-register for that program. The first round, uh, we did make awards um, last spring, late fall. Um, and with that, the first round, we did award over $4.3 million. As a reminder, the appropriation that was given to us was $15 million, and that is a rolling um, dollar amount until all of those dollars are spent. Uh, a couple things I like to point out about this slide is the average cost in this round of applications was almost $9,000 per passing. Um, I also want to point out that there are match dollars. So this is a program that our providers are being very thoughtful when they make their applications and are putting match towards it. So it's not 100%, um, and I think that's really important to acknowledge. And then with this first round, we were able to serve 204, or excuse me, 843 homes and businesses. And I believe there are three that are almost done. So this is directly impacting um, communities, people right away. Um, they do have a year to build out once they're awarded. So it is a pretty aggressive timeline. Um, and then we'll continue uh, to fund rounds until all of those dollars are exhausted. Now, next time I give a presentation on the line extension, um, those average costs per locations could change. It all really just depends on where the bids come in and as locations are continuing to be added to the portal. I will say the portal, when we close this round, um, you can see there was over 2,300 that were registered. That's over 3,000 now. So we're continuing to work with people as they reach out to our office um, and apply for this program. 
All right, so I talked a little bit about the BEAD. So again, that acronym is Broadband Equity Access and Deployment, and those are that federal dollars. Um, and with um, the IIJA funding, there were two programs. So again, the BEAD, which is the infrastructure part of the funding, and then the other part is the digital equity funding. Minnesota's allocation um, is based on a formula, based on those FCC maps at the time that the formulas uh, were designated. So as a reminder, Minnesota's bead allocation is $652 million, and again, that was based on the FCC maps. In Minnesota, the legislature has directed that all IIJA funding go through our existing border-to-border -border, uh, programs and the Office of Broadband, so we'll continue to do that work. Um, details on the initial proposal, um, we'll talk a little bit in the next slide, I believe, but one thing I think is really important to note with this, these dollars, we are required to serve as priority number one all of the unserved locations first. After we can show that we can get to all of those locations, we can move into priority two, which would be the underserved. And then from there, if we still have dollars left, um, we can move on to community anchor institutions. Again, those are rules um, and guidance um, that are with um, the federal dollars tied to it. Um, so this is, again, a granular sort of map, but gives you an idea of where those FCC uh, maps designated that um, are unserved areas. Those definitions is under 25.3, underserved, which is 100 by 20, um, and then the green um, already has reliable service. So the red, again, is the underserved, so take note in that first. Um, per NTIA, they include both wired and licensed fixed wireless as reliable broadband service. Um, Minnesota historically has only considered wired broadband service, um, and so we're still working on negotiations within our final plan on what that looks like. Um, and then the final thing I want to say on this is once our volume, so the initial proposal is broken up into two pieces, volume one and volume two. Once our volume one is totally approved by NTIA and we've negotiated what we want that to look like, we go into what is called a challenge process. So the challenge process um, is a time where nonprofits, internet service providers, and local units of government can challenge those maps and those locations. There may be locations on that map that are in the middle of a field and happen to be an old shed that is never going to get broadband service. We'd want those to be removed. There may be locations that were completely missed in our residence. We would want those to be added. So this will um, happen in about a 120-day window once our volume one is approved um, to do so. And we are trying our best to um, work with all of those who can do challenges to prepare them for this pr uh, process. One thing to note is every location that we do find is incredibly important and is the mission of our office. However, there's no additional dollars that are tied to making sure we deploy to those places. All right, so this slide I won't spend a lot of time on, but um, even our previous presenters um, want to share a little bit about challenges in the work we do. And so this is to say the same. That as we are working through our proposals and trying to uh, do deployment, work with all of our um, partners, our providers, we know that there are challenges, whether it is weather. Uh, it's interesting how many conversations I have with other states that think weather is an issue. Um, well, yes, it is. Maybe not this year. But uh, we can't do deployment when the ground is frozen in most cases. Um, certainly time is of consideration because all states and territories are going to be doing this work at the same time. So will there be supply chain issues, workforce issues, all of those things. So we are certainly tracking and monitoring and listening to um, all of our providers and our community partners. All right, so a little bit about the timeline is, as I told you, there's volume one and two of our initial proposal. Both have been submitted once. We have recently just submitted our second round of curing or negotiating on volume one. Um, there are some things in there that we feel strongly that really align with Minnesota's uh, goals and directives and um, are working through that. 
Um, and then volume two, we're in the first round of negotiating um, some changes uh, within that as well. Again, the legislature has directed this to closely align with BEAT as much as possible. Uh, so really trying to do our due diligence on that and also be a good partner to the federal government. Um, let's see here. So we are, again, I said the challenge process. I would say this is a little aggressive. I would say the challenge process might be closer to April when it started. There's a 30-day window for folks to challenge, 30-day window for the challenge of the challenge, and then we deduplicate after that and go through and make sure that all of those credible challenges are there, and, and then we'll have a final snapshot on time of what those maps and what those locations finally look like. Um, then we will start the initial proposal, and within the initial proposal, we have 365 days to complete that. Within that time period, we do have to select all the subgrantees, so every location has to have a provider who is willing to serve them. And um, with that, once we get all of that through and we're in a good place, we'll submit that. And then hopefully we get our dollars and we can start to get to construction, uh, which I would, if I had to guesstimate, um, we're looking at early 2026 just due to weather constraints. All right, so transition, transitioning a little bit is the Digital Equity Act. So with the IIJA, there was also um, the Digital Equity Act, and this is where Minnesota received $881,000 to plan and build a plan that works for Minnesota. Um, once we have a plan which has been submitted and we're just doing a few um, a few things to cure it and make sure that uh, both uh, the state and, and the federal agencies are happy. Um, once that is approved, um, then hopefully we will have uh, capacity grants to be able to do the work that has been identified in there. And so how did we identify what our plan is? Well, we went out to communities. Um, we had over 106 digital connection communities across the state that were self-directed. So they could register. It could be uh, nonprofits, faith groups, local units of governments, libraries, uh, nonprofits, whatever it is, and they are the ones that have the most knowledge and relationships in their community. They also understand the barriers, the needs, and the resources and assets that they have. We also did 18 listening sessions across the state as well to hear feedback uh, on our initial plan. So we didn't build a plan in our office and say, hey, comment on it. We had them provide all that information, and we wrote a plan that we think is very thoughtful to Minnesota. Um, and one thing I do want to share that came out of that is the, 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 the highlights that we see, and you can see there's sort of a vision statement there, but what people really identified is people want to be connected to people. They want to be connected to opportunities, and they want to be uh, connected to options. So that's the focus that we had as we were doing this planning. And you can see a couple pictures of different town halls and focus groups uh, that were across the state. Within the plan, there are examples of activities that we hope will be eligible to use in our capacity grants to fund. Um, so not only were we able to build capacity in all of these communities uh, moving forward, but they helped identify what are the needs in their communities. So for instance, you know, do we need some more digital opportunity data, data analysis? Uh, do we need uh, a digital opportunity leaders network across the state? What does that look like? We're hopeful that we encompassed everything um, that we could possibly think of that could go into eligibility for capacity grants once the notice of funding comes uh, from the federal government. All right, and so where are we now? As I stated, our plan is on the website. It is the original draft that was sent into NTIA for approval. Um, we just submitted our second draft of that to NTIA for approval, and we're hopeful that we met all of the needs that they needed us to identify within that plan. As of right now, we do not know when our capacity grants will be coming. I will say that the state of Maine last week was the first state um, to have their digital equity plan approved. My understanding by law, they have 30 days now to issue the notice of funding. So hopefully in 30 days we'll have more information, we'll know how much we will be getting, and when we can start um, moving forward in those um, areas to do the work that we've identified here in Minnesota. 
All right, my last slide. All of this um, is really hard work and really important work, but if people can't access it or afford it, um, it really is um, in vain. And so I just like to point out that right now, more than 238,000 Minnesotans are taking, um, utilizing the ACP program. Um, we do have over three times eligible. Um, and this funding is scheduled to run out very soon. And this is a federal program, but any advocacy that we can do at the state to show how important this is, this would be a huge lift for a state uh, to do. And so I just want to point that out. Um, it's really important. And um, if you are not familiar with this program, it does uh, provide up to $30 a month um, to the homes and businesses to help pay for a low cost uh, program uh, or plan, and then in our tribal communities, it pays up to $75 per month. And with that, my contact information of certainly is up there. Always happy um, to answer any questions if you have, and certainly open for questions now. Thank you, Ms. Mackey, for your presentation. I have a quick question. One of the things we did last session is we monkeyed a bit with the disposition between low density and traditional border to border grants. Um, would you say that the ratio that we are employing currently is appropriate and prudent and working for you? Was that the way it should be? Oh, thank you, Chair uh, Putnam. Yes, yeah, so this is a conversation we're having a lot in our office. Uh, when we do our grant uh, round nine awards, we'll have some more data and certainly happy to share that as we continue to see the request for the low population go up and maybe the request for traditional border to kind of balance out or, you know, move. Because, again, we know these locations, if they were easy um, and they were... Uh, cost effective for our providers, they probably would have already been served. So, yes, that is a very valid question and something we're paying much attention to. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Mackey. Members, uh, questions, comments? Senator Kunish. I think we both have questions down here. Um, I'm looking, well, there's a bunch of pages on here that really are interesting. Um, the $50 million available. Let's see, and 30 of that is border to border and 20 for low density population. <clears throat> and then I look at, okay, and I don't, I don't have a page number, but that's the state funding, or yes, that's the one. And then I look at, um, I look at uh, the page federal digital equity, the planning strategy one, and um, all those, those um, symbols are around the exterior, mostly around the exterior of Minnesota. Um, are those the places where you held those, those hearing sessions or is, are those the areas that you think are most vulnerable? Ms. Mackey. Uh, thank you, Chair Putnam. Senator, so a couple questions. Um, I'm not sure if there was a question on the first one, so I apologize with the $50 million and how that's broken down. But yes, $100 million in the biennium, $50 million for grant round nine, and then we'll do another $50 million um, awards after July 1st because that would be the, the next um, fiscal year. Um, and then your question as far as the digital planning, uh, it's a great observation. Um, we had a lot of digital connection committees within the metro area. These are just sites across the state that we went out and did listening sessions, mm -hmm. so those 18. And we did, um, which I did attend, I know one in Hennepin um, and a couple others within there. So um, I guess if we add them all up, on the outside, the middle would be more of the metro. So it's more just a demonstration that we tried to get across the state. Sure. And, oh, sorry. Senator Kunish. Appreciate that. Um, and honestly, um, I was a library media specialist when COVID hit and the lack of broadband, you know, I saw firsthand how, um, how much of a need there is. We just kind of took that for, for granted in a lot of areas. So I represent three counties, uh, Anoka, Hennepin, and Ramsey County, and that would be more in that rural area. Um, and then I'm, I'm just looking at the bead funding. 
uh, page, priority two, service to all underserved locations identified on an FCC map. I know that there are locations in urban communities, not just my three uh, um, counties, and like Hennepin I know has you know, very rural areas with poor uh, internet access. And then w there are also inner city and rural er or uh, urban areas that ha also have challenges to accessing internet. And so would they fall under that priority too? Um, even though it says underserved locations, I'm just kind of trying to think of how to explain it. Like, Community-wise, how do you define underserved location? Yeah. Ms. Mackey. Yes, thank you, Chairman and Senator. So um, your first question or first comment with the library <laughs> is, you. if you didn't know, um, Hannah Buckland, who is our digital equity lead, uh, is a librarian, and she will be the first to say, you can tell because I'm wearing a cardigan. Okay. <laughs> um, and so um, we really have had great partnership with our libraries across the state, and many of our connection committee meetings, um, sessions, listening sessions were at libraries. So we're so thankful for that partnership um, and the knowledge that they have. Your second question is, um, I think this is, a question we get a lot. Um, if there are unserved locations, whether it's urban or metro, and they are just not served, and we mm -hmm. know there are some gaps even in our metro, they would be eligible for either border-to-border -border grants um, or the bead dollars. The most important thing that counties right now can do, and I've had these conversations with, with your counties, is to be prepared for the challenge process. Okay. And so that is the time where they can make sure that all the locations within their area Area, if are unserved or underserved, are on those maps. Okay. Um, and I do think that they um, they understand that and happy if you want me to connect again with them. But that's really what we're trying to gear up is understanding that the need is everywhere. And once those locations are on those maps, it is our responsibility at the Office of Broadband to make sure that all those unserved and underserved locations are served. Now. We only have limited dollars, so how they're served is a little bit of a challenge, but we're working through that. And just Sorry, one more question. Is there a deadline by when those dollars, once the grant is granted, is there a deadline by when those dollars have to be spent? Ms. Mackey. Thank you, Chairman um, and Senator. So with the B dollars, um, before we even get the dollars, all those locations have to be shown serve during our sub-grantee selection process. So we basically take that map, all the unserved locations, we put that in a plan and show NTIA that we're serving them by whatever provider we're able to get in those locations um, and meet those needs. Uh, once all of that is approved, um, NTIA has been a little bit back and forth on that as far as the deadline, but it could be between four and five years for deployment. Now for us at the Office of Broadband, we like two years. We don't want to wait around. So um, there might be where we would award priority ones first, priority twos, because that workload is going to be astronomical if we're dealing with 50 million in grant rounds and then to ask a team, a small team to do that. Plus making sure that um, all of our providers are able to be prepared. There's the, the workforce and all the other yeah. things. So there is time within the BEAD program um, to, to do that work, but really the essence of it happens during the challenge process and making sure uh, that our subgrantee selection um, is accurate. Um, and is achievable. Okay. Thank you. Senator Kunish? Nope. Thank you. Members, other questions or comments? Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, thank you for your presentation. Uh, really well uh, just a question on the line extension program. I think it's going to be This is my question. Senator Dornick, is your microphone on? Oh, it's not. Sorry. <laughs> did you hear me? I'm sorry. I did. <laughs> uh, Ms. Mackey. 
Thank you, Chairman and Senator. So this is a rolling application process. So if somebody has applied in whatever time period, they can apply any time. They don't have to reapply. Um, and so they continue to stay sort of in that hopper until uh, there are bids on that location by a provider. Um, or until they're served by some other grant program. Um, but there's no deadline for applications of individual locations. Um, there's just deadlines for the application window period where we sort of stop and do sort of a stop in time, review all the applications, put it out for bids for the providers, um, and then make awards. So it can, people should continue to apply. However, just being very clear, they don't have to continue to apply. Right. Senator Dornick. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, your timeline for the bead program, I'm just wondering, once you'd go, uh, is there an ongoing uh, construction compliance going on as we speak? As far as, it looks like here, uh, the compliance, uh, you're going into challenge process right now, and does that mean that the money or the, when they are approved, that construction doesn't start until 2026 for this past year? Ms. Mackey? Letting of that money? Um, yeah, so thank you, Chairman, uh, Senator. So just to be really clear, um, the B dollars are here and border to border is here. So as we make our border to border grant state dollars, the 50 million construction will continue. And there are still construction happening from previous grant rounds as well. The B dollars, um, until we have a total final approved plan by the, the NTIA through the, the Department of Commerce, we can't begin construction and we can't begin contracting. And so all of that is what's happening on that timeline. So until we can execute those contracts, which as you noted, November, December 2025, once we get all of that secured with our providers who are doing the work, we can then go into the next construction season, which is where I said 2026 is probably where we're going to see our first projects in the ground. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so, Ms. Mackey, uh, how many people do you expect to be selected out of the BEAD program? Ms. Mackey. Thank you, Chairman and Senator. So um, all that are identified on the map at the time the challenge process is over. So the FCC map that designated our $652 million had around approximately 135,000 homes and businesses that were unserved locations. So at a minimum, somewhere around that. Now with the challenge process, that may grow it, and it might also take locations out that aren't actually locations. So it's gonna give and take. I think it's really important to note that those maps are based on 25-3. Our standard in Minnesota is 100 by 20. So what you would maybe define as un unserved, might be served if they're over the 25-3, and technically are in priority two, of where we can fund. So once we get through all priority one, which is the unserved locations, at that snapshot in time on the map, then we can move into priority two, and that would be the underserved, and that would be the 100 by 20. Senator Anderson. Thank you. Members, other questions or comments? Thank you very much for a, a thorough and educational presentation. Thank you. Next up, we're going to hear about the state of dairy uh, from Minnesota Milk. Mr. Sostrom, if you would, please. State your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready.
May I, Mr. Chair? Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Uh, for the record, my name is Lucas Schostrom. I serve as Executive Director of the Minnesota Milk Producers Association. Uh, as was said, we, I was asked to present on the state of the dairy industry in Minnesota today. Um, this is two weeks and a day ahead of Dairy Day at the Capitol, so I've got no treats, no videos. Uh, this is marketing. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, it's coming. You have to hang on. Um, I think I saw Tori get up to, to leave. Uh. <laughs> we, are the, we, are, we are the other white sugar, um, and we'll talk about that in, uh, in, a, in a couple weeks. Uh, but we have a wide range of members, including the largest and smallest farms in our state. Uh, Minnesota's dairies are diverse. Uh, we have conventional, robotic, organic, grazing, multifamily, investor groups, and even a few educational institutions, which are oft forgotten. I think what's hard to explain is that no matter how a dairy farm came together, it takes an extreme amount of passion to run one. The volatility in both prices and your daily chores takes a certain mindset and tenacity. We are a $9 billion industry each year, so that's like building nine U.S. bank stadiums every single year uh, for the dairy industry in Minnesota from, from soil uh, through processing. Uh, and that's about a $25,000 per cow impact. So as I said, I'm here today to give you an overview of our state's economy. Uh, to hit the high points on the pricing end, we have about $17 per hundredweight. And I know that maybe means nothing to you, but it takes about $18 a hundredweight right now today on almost any size dairy farm and uh, some $20 for the cost of production. So most dairy farms right now today are losing $1 to $3. But usually I can sit here and, and until probably about a year ago, I could sit here and tell you that number and almost everyone in the state would be paid within 10 or 20 cents of that amount uh, due to various factors that would take far too long to get into. Uh, we have probably a range of three or four dollars in the state today of what our average price is and, and what uh, some creameries are just able to pay um, uh, just due to factors uh, with, within their control but, but probably beyond their immediate control, otherwise they would be more competitive. Um, Uh, so I, I don't like the trend that we're on. About every five years, I'm called in here to tell you about the deep hole in the dairy industry that we're in. The last time was 2019. Uh, with your help, we passed the DAIRI program in, in 2018 and 2019, and I was glad to see us uh, uh, supported again last year. Um, but the markets have changed significantly uh, in, in the past five years. 2019 was what I would call a normal downturn. We had low beef prices low dairy prices. 2020 was, of course, the pandemic, and I think every commodity, every industry was waiting for the worst, but we had a huge run-up in cheese prices, which is what we make here in the upper Midwest between March and June of that year. It ended up being pretty good. 2021 was tough as the market figured out a new normal, and then 2022 was a record in almost every way, shape, or form. Uh, it didn't feel like it just due to the impact of the prior two years and a lot of newness, but on paper, 2022 was, was quite a significant year in the dairy industry. Uh, we went into a lukewarm 2023, and we spiraled kind of down to a very rough end of 2023 and, and tough start to 2024. And that has created some news stories, and I think that's uh, partially why I was asked to be here today. So I'm sure you're thinking with all that, you know, what about the young farmers? How do we get new and beginning farmers in the state of Minnesota in the dairy industry? And it's something my organization has as, as one of our tenants to work on. Um, I'll, I'm here to tell you two things. Uh, we do get more new, young, beginning farmers every year in the dairy industry, every single year here in Minnesota. But we don't get more total new, young, beginning farmers every year as attrition uh, continues to grow. I think one of the things that happens, uh, especially in the dairy industry, we have a very high cost of entry now compared to what we used to have. And I had many friends uh, growing up and, and neighbors growing up who might milk a certain number of cows, go work off farm during the day, and then finish up chores that night uh, with an eight or 10 hour break in between. Uh, today, that's almost impossible just due to the capital requirements and, and the work required to make ends meet. Uh, this is somewhat true across all commodities and probably true across all small businesses that you need to just get a little better each year uh, with your service or good. And if that's the case, uh, you need to continue to improve your cost of production or in some way, shape, or form, improve your revenue. 
And that's what makes farming so special. The holders of the vast majority of private land in the United States are farmers. And so inevitably, some farmers are going to be better than others. And with a commodity market, like I said, you need to beat that average commodity price with your cost of production. So in other words, and I think this is, this is something that's forgotten, as the old joke goes, you don't really need to outrun the bear. You just need to outrun the other people trying to outrun the bear. And what that means is if your neighbor's cost of production is, is one number and yours is another, certainly we're all in some ways in competition with each other, but we're actually in competition whatever that magical cost of production is internationally now today as our exports have grown from less than 2% when I was born a couple of years ago to about 19% today. And we think the growth in the world will continue to uh, make this more and more of an international market. Because I can tell you're all going to be back here in a week and a day, I will show you the full video uh, showing what was announced earlier this week of Tim and Carrie Kerfeld. They are our Minnesota Milk Producers of the Year. They may not be here uh, as dairy producers. They're going to take their first vacation in 14 years during Dairy Day at the Capitol. Not on purpose. We told them after it was booked. Um, but they took on robotic milking units, allowing their farm to focus on custom farming. They've tried cover crops, and they're getting specialized with custom farming. Custom farming is a way of farming another farm's land or your neighbor's land by running equipment for them. Um, what you will not hear um, is that their key to success is, is paying more money. But uh, I know one of the benefits that um, the Kerfelds have is, is a lot of family members involved in the business, and one of their keys, therefore, is relying on family labor as they've grown and not paying other people's wages. And I just want to say that's one way to do it, and there's many other ways to continue to grow your business. But the method the Kerfelds have has many benefits and about as many drawbacks. And so you can look at this both sides, whatever sort of dairy farm you want. Let's think of the benefits. When you pay yourself, it's cheaper because you can pay yourself zero, take no vacations, and pay down debt faster. The drawbacks, of course, are that you might not pay yourself anything, you might not get any time off, and a few bad bets when you sell your commodities in the market, or if you have major breakdowns of equipment all in a row, you might not ever meet the cash flow needed to get to success. The trade-offs with employees, uh, you can probably tell uh, more time off or time to do other things. It's more expensive sooner, and you can still have all the same items break and a bigger expense needed set to spread it all out. So no matter how you do it, your job is to keep your cost of production low or find additional sources of revenue and income. Making more milk with more cows helps you do this, or just making less milk very efficiently per cow can also allow you to do this. We have a 10% roughly rate, plus or minus 2%, in Minnesota and nationwide of our farms who establish their cows as genetically with more information. And they are called registered cattle. And they can market their genetics to their neighbors. They can market their genetics around the world. And that's something that all of our species in the state probably have in some way, shape, or form. And uh, some farms do a little bit of that. And some of them base basically their entire market off that as another way to diversify their income. Uh, the other option is to take your milk market and, and leave it or diversify it from the commodity market altogether. Uh, this is very high risk, but I would say Minnesota and USDA currently have great resources to do that. I'd be happy to talk about that more if you have questions, but we'll focus on the commodity market today. One of the mis misrepresentations today is that we're losing more dairy farmers than ever. Certainly, we have the current data set of monthly records from 2007, and we had a month in December 20, 2023 that caused a storm because we lost more farms and a higher percentage than ever before. But I want to click to the next slide and show you over time since 2013. This is actually Illinois data from their farm business management system, uh, but I, I found it to be very good data. And you can see, besides a couple of years, uh, really one year, um, if you count all of your costs, uh, dairy farms do not pay back because, again, we are not paying ourselves at the full rate. When that green line is above that pink line, uh, that is called owners taking a discount to make the farm work. When that uh, green line is above the red line, that is the only time farmers in Illinois, which I would say is probably pretty close to following small farms in, in Minnesota also, is the only time we are actually returning you know, a full accounting value uh, back to our farms according to this data. 
But uh, when we talk about individual yearly trends, and it looks like I've got some uh, carryover of the years there, but I think you can tell on the left you have 2007, and on the right you have 2023. Our numbers inch up month by month, uh, typically to um, a height in December, uh, and then back down in January. And one of the reasons for that is because cows production cycle, we will dry them off in November and December. They take about a two month break and they come back. And that depends on the season, uh, but it's also sort of a um, clerical uh, update and the Department of Agriculture can tell you about this. As we reset our farms for the year, uh, it's a time to check in on all of our farms and see where people are at. So I don't uh, know that the, the um, drop in farms per month is as steep as that shows there in all earnesty, but um, how we keep records, this is how the data shows up uh, back to 2007. And then I finally I wanted to show um, the trend in U.S. dairy farms, which as you can see on the screen is in orange and is the right y-axis with the bigger numbers versus the Minnesota dairy farms um, on the left. We have less data. Uh, USDA stopped collecting yearly data in 2013, unfortunately, so we've just got the census points of 27 and last week, uh, 2022. And you can see the lines are pretty similar, um, and I would say the USDA data is not as accurate as our state data uh, because it's more of an estimation and, and it's a census or a survey, but certainly not every dairy farm is going to participate. So uh, you can see the 2017 number is higher than trend, while the 2022 number at USDA is much lower than trend, whereas Minnesota has been pretty steady. And um, again, I don't, I don't think we're seeing a vastly significant difference in a drop of farms in Minnesota compared to the country, but I do believe we're seeing a vast different amount of startups. And uh, beginning in January, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture started recording that, both exits, but also new startup farms. And so I think that will help us going forward was just something we took for granted before. So um, what are the things overlying the current market that um, that made this, that continue this trend. One, I think the most difficult is transitioning the farm to the next generation. I'm in my late 30s, but there are many people working on farms much older than me who've been on that farm their entire life or pretty close to it and have no equity. They might be the primary manager, they might be the primary decision maker, but it is very difficult just accounting wise and in tax wise to find a way to transition that equity from one generation to the next. Um, there needs to be a will from the new to previous generation. So the social side of this is probably um, uh, more important. But just doing math, we should expect fewer farms every year. I've, I led to this before. Um, in other industries, we had big box stores prolifer proliferate over the past handful of decades, and now we have fewer corner shops. Uh, but we do have specialized shops that try to do it, that uh, have superior service and can create more margin. We also have, and I think we're gonna hear in a little bit, the Minnesota Dairy Initiative Program, uh, dairy business planning grants, and an excellent farm business management program to help with this. But, at, but as all other examples of the commodity market would show you, if you're behind, you're more likely to fall further behind. And if you're ahead, you're more likely to stay further ahead. That means a few drought years on a well-run farm or a couple major f farm equipment repairs or an unexpected tax bill or other legal situation can make a good operator look really bad and go out of business. We advocate for risk management with local insurance agents where federal programs come into play. And I already mentioned the state DAIRI or Dairy with an I program to encourage federal participation as a rebate uh, situation and I think for that reason, anecdotally, we are hearing of very few bankruptcies and foreclosures in the Minnesota dairy industry compared to uh, the previous 25 years before 2019. Another trend I see is the inability to move to other milk markets. And this one's brand new. This is about five years old. Uh, for the first 100 years of our modern dairy industry's existence, if you did not like something your dairy cooperative dairy processor was doing politically or with milk price, you could pick up the phone and say, hey, will you pick up my milk next month? And that processor would very likely answer and say, what's your quantity? What's your quality? Sounds great. Let's make a deal. Uh, for the past five years, that hasn't been the case. Our cheese plants need to run full, optimally at least 85 to 90% full. 
Um, but now uh, are getting very strategic at the size they are and the, the investment they need that they need to be planning out three and five years. And so they are focusing on very wisely their current member milk rather than taking on somebody new or taking on a neighbor. And so that creates limitations for current farmers and for beginning farmers wanting to start and do something different. Another trend that um, is, is very different, and I mentioned it before, is high beef prices. And one of the reasons uh, we aren't seeing the bankruptcies and aren't seeing the foreclosures that we saw in crises of the past 20 years is you have a second option. A great dairy cow turns into fantastic hamburger. And um, right now is a time you can do that profitably. Uh, in the past, typically you would have no place to sell your milk profitably, and you would also have no place to sell uh, uh, cull animals as we would call them for harvest. And so you'd be stuck in this pickle of your bank didn't want you to sell anything because they wanted you to cash flow on milk, and uh, you were losing money whichever way you went. And finally, um, I'll mention this just one more time, but the extremely high cost of capital. We again have fantastic nation-leading state programs in the Livestock Investment Grant. Uh, we would note that that used to be a larger match and larger program. Uh, farms used to be able to use up to 10% of a $500,000 investment instead of a $250,000 investment. And as inflation and as prices has gone up, uh, we have far surpassed uh, what some of the early grants would have looked like in the same amount of cost, again, due to inflation. So all that said, it is difficult to get started, but that means there continues to be opportunities for current dairy farmers. We have record beef prices, and we are expecting that will lead to higher milk prices going forward in 2024, although the futures don't show that yet. There's also an opportunity for dairy farmers to upgrade their herd, or in a worst case scenario, potentially liquidate their herd with some equity remaining due to today's beef prices. If you're looking to go to non-commodity processing, like I said before, there are more resources than ever. We've seen a few plants come together in recent years in this regard. Some have failed, some have succeeded. It's extremely risky. And finally, if you're heading into the commodity milk market and have found a plant to take on your milk, there is equipment available as our farms do tend to upgrade to newer equipment. So there's new opportunity for a young farmer to take a farm who is selling out and retiring their herd for the final time to take on that equipment. Other farms are transitioning to robotics, so there's relatively new parlors available for sale. Um, but it depends on, excuse me. Uh, so there's some new opportunity for a young farmer to take cows that may already be owned at a different family member's or a different employer's farm and break off but uh, finding that milk market is incredibly risky uh, without a great equity position. So in summary, I think it's always going to be a risky time in a, in a value-added commodity market like dairy, but I think the Minnesota dairy farms are dug in. They're making a plan to survive to the next generation, or maybe they're planning their exit here at an unfortunate downturn in the market. I think with the resources the legislature has made available in years past, beginning farms in Minnesota will continue to have an opportunity to compete, but what a creamery processor defines as a minimum size to start may change in future years. Um, so if you want to ask what I would suggest to you to do or not do, here are the uh, three or four things. First, costs. Like I said, we're trying to outrun the other people outrunning the bear of cost of production. Any fee, mandated op operating costs increase, like through permitting or employer um, requirements or tax, raises the cost of production. Minnesota farms pay taxes and fees in many ways, and if your effort is to remain the, below the average cost of production, you need to treat your employees, cows, land, and equipment well, so today's farmers are well-versed in how efficient they need to be for individual situation. Second, infrastructure. Uh, after keeping costs as low as possible uh, from the state perspective, Supporting our infrastructure in cities that have dairy plants would be number one. I think we've got some opportunity for investment right now. I think we've got innovative plants putting in innovative technologies, and I hope we can support that through bonding or other measures. There are also currently grant programs out there uh, to support those. I already mentioned it once, but we're going to hear about the dairy profit teams and Minnesota Dairy Initiative next. Supporting that can go a long ways. It's not an overnight fix. It is about farmers and their teammates, their nutritionists, their veterinarian, their banker, et cetera, et cetera, sitting down and forming a plan. How do we improve to go to our next step over the next five years? And finally, the DAIRI, or Dairy with an I program, is a rebate on dairy margin coverage. 
So those are the things I wanted to mention today. Uh, these are the opportunities we currently have uh, that I mentioned. And with that, uh, Senator Putnam, uh, Chair Putnam, I'll take any questions you or the committee has. Thank you, Mr. Shosham. Uh, questions? Members? Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the, the update. Um, what's the average size? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. <laughs> yeah, it's on. Uh, what's the average size of, a, size of the herd, a dairy herd in Minnesota now? Yeah, Mr. Shostrom. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Dornick, it's about 211 cattle from what I last have seen. Mr. Chair. Senator Dornick. So do uh, most of those bigger farmers, or dairy farmers, milk twice a day or three times a day? Mr. Shostrom. Uh, Senator Putnam, Senator Dornick, I, it's so variable today. Um, due to labor, some farms that want to be milking three times a day have cut back to two just because the people aren't available. Many people are, are looking at robotics, and those will milk anywhere from two and a half to 3.4, 3.7 times a day. Uh, but I would say, generally speaking, the average is, is two times a day, but it it really depends on the farm, depends on the management. Some also sneak in their, their fresh cows, those uh, the first 90 days in milk, four times a day. So there's not a good way to answer the question. Two is still uh, the average, but uh, your question was those bigger farms. Um, and I would say a bigger farm is always the one that has one cow more than I have. Uh, so I, I don't think there's a trend also on, on, you know, we have at my house 150 cows right now. Uh, I wouldn't say 151 cows and up, you can put them in the two times a day or three times a day or robotic category. It's really variable based on local needs and, and um, labor availability. Senator Dornick. Mr. Chair, uh, I'm just amazed at how you guys just, uh, that milking cows is just such a love and I grew up on a dairy farm and appreciate that and, and I know how hard you work uh, day in and day out, twice a day, three times a day, whatever it is. And yet I remember back in the, date myself here in the late 70s when I was a kid on the farm and talking about $10 milk, you know. And we're at, I think, seven, 17. And just think of the cost increase, inflation, and we're talking quite a few years. And I, I and the break point, what did you say was 18? Just the continued um, stress that must be and the hours worked and to make ends meet and I'm just going to throw that exemption again. You talked about the cost of production and the employment and how just another mandate by the state with the earn, sick, and safe uh, and trying to get an ag uh, exemption for agriculture, how important that is. And I'm hoping that maybe uh, through this committee and others that people understand what kind of pressure and stress that you guys are under to try to make a living. So with that, Mr. Chair, thank you. Senator Westrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Lucas, thanks for your comments and uh, testimony. On the robotic side, um, what, where are we at on price per robot now? Uh, I think it used to be around $200,000 per robot, and generally a robot could milk about 60 cows a day. Um, are you seeing the price come down, or is that stable, or has it gone up? And what are you seeing for robots? Is it still a slow adoption and price being the big restriction or the technology still being what people are cautious of or just, just your thoughts on that? And it seems like we, we, we're going to end up going that down that road much more in the future. Mr. Shosin. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, uh, I'd say the 200,000 figure is about right. One of the things that happened in the past few years is why lower the price when you can upgrade the technology? So those 60 cow robots can now milk 80 cows, uh, so they're more valuable. And, and okay. I should say the 200,000 figure is probably with a robot and all the equipment that goes with it. So four robots would be 800,000 or something like that. And, and then you've got investments in the barn and, and other things like that. So I think that figure that you shared is, is about accurate. Um, there's certainly new technologies coming forward there and other types of robots manure robots, feed robots, feeding robots uh, that are coming on the scene. We have a few automatic feeding robots. And what a few farmers who have them have told me is when you have a milking robot, for example, um, you still need someone to come feed every day. That's probably the most important job on the farm in many ways because you need to be so precise. The microbes 
in the rumen, in the cow stomach, that convert the feed into milk and meat. Uh, if they're disrupted too much, it's a fermentation process. Fermentation dies and the cow gets sick really fast. So that feeding process is so important. And those who have the robotic automated feeders have told me that that's probably the best investment they've made because then they can truly leave the farm for a day because nobody needs to be there because that robot will be very precise. Uh, milking cows is, is certainly a high skill job. It's a hard work job, but um, there's, there's, uh, it's not as, um, we, we have enough structure in place, I think, that it's not as precise as the feeding aspect of it. Senator Western. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, another, another question uh, with milk. Um, do we do do we do much in Minnesota and in, in, in Minnesota or uh, in the United States otherwise with um, ultra filtered milk? I've heard a lot about, but recently heard more about ultra filtered heat milk, and I'm not sure I've got the word right, but it's it's another type of filtered milk, but it allows milk products to be put on this regular store shelf without refrigeration it gives them about three months of shelf life and so you don't have the refrigeration issue and uh, other countries do this I'm wondering does that get done much in the United States is it a new technology or is it something that has been around a long time because year, years ago um, at a constituent that's uh, up in age Spent a lot of time over in Saudi Arabia for his job, and he always talked to me about this milk that they he just bought. They just buy it on the shelf in Saudi Arabia, and I thought, well, I don't know. Maybe they drink sour milk over there. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> and I thought, or maybe he just doesn't remember quite as much as he did. But he he was emphatic about they did not refrigerate their milk over there, and, uh, and so. Uh, Doing more investigation, I've, I've come to learn that there is a process uh, with a heat treatment that, that does make milk a shelf-stable product for, for three months or better. And I'm just wondering, what do you know about that? And is that something we see around our state or country? And is that something new, or is that old technology? Mr. Shostom. Um <clears throat> Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, in the state of Minnesota, to my knowledge, the only ultra filtration uh, systems we have are within cheese plants, and they are to kind of take the milk apart and put it back together perfectly into the production system that they want. Uh, again, to my knowledge, we aren't currently going to liquid form, and that's because we have built very well put together cheese plants, and as I said before, we need to keep them full to keep them running efficiently. Uh, the the steps there are to actually run the cheese process and then we create whey by at certain points pulling out protein, pulling out fat, and, and ultimately pulling out lactose, the sugar in milk, uh, to be able to create different products that we send all around the world. We say cheese plants, but for most of the past 25 years, the profit in our cheese plants in Minnesota has come from the whey process, which are our infant formulas, our proteins in Snicker bars and Gatorades, and are, are obviously the whey protein that you might buy if you're um, trying to meet weight requirements, either, either losing or gaining. But um, uh, to my knowledge, we don't have a fluid plant in Minnesota. Around the country, we certainly do. Uh, it's growing. Um, if you all run for Congress or the U.S. Senate and win those seats, I'll be happy to talk to you much more about those issues. But uh, due to our classified pricing system, in, in my opinion, we really have done a lot to limit innovation. Um, we're, we're starting to break free of that. And it's taken a very long time to get off of our traditional products that are defined by USDA. Uh, one of the unintended consequences of USDA being very specific in the types of products uh, that we must have and, and uh, providing underlying make allowances for them means that uh, that's what people made because they knew there would be a market for it in Chicago. So long story short, yes, we have a, a handful of ultra-filtered milk products, uh, product plants in the country. Uh, Fairlife is probably the most well-known brand, uh, sits on the shelf for a very long time. Um, I know Dairy Farmers of America, which is a uh, has has owners here in Minnesota, also makes a, a similar product. 
Uh, those are the two I'm familiar with, but it's, it's just beginning to grow as we uh, have capacity to do more innovation. So maybe a long answer to a, a little bit shorter question, but we're, we're learning. And it's, yes, it's just sending milk through very fine filters at high pressure uh, and separating out the protein and lactose, especially turning it into other products and either reconstituting it back together or um, separating those products for drying and shipment around the world. A lot of pigs in China, uh, for their first, uh, from day two to day 20, they, they drink um, reconstituted American whey from our cheese plants to supplement their diet. Senator Westrom. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that's all I have. Thanks for coming. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Um, used to milk cows until I was 15, and, and my dad said uh, all the rules and regulations that were coming down from wherever uh, basically put him out of business. And um, I'm just wondering, in your estimation, you're working with state, federal, all rules and regulations. How much cost does that put in, and how much of a, I mean, you, you mentioned the challenges already that uh, are, are coming down, and, and uh, you, you, get, you get all these different agencies from the state and the federal coming into play, and they've got one rule coming in here, one rule coming in here, and uh, to me, it puts a, a bind on you. I know it did for my father. Uh, we wanted to keep farming, but my dad told me to go get a real job. And I thought farming was a real job. So I just, uh, it's curious to know because I, I hear, I've already heard just in the last two days, three days of farmers right now in Minnesota, uh, just not too far from here, uh, out in the Midwest part of our state that are being put upon by state agency rules and guidelines. So any uh, estimation of what those costs might be? Mr. Shostrom. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson. Um, it's, there's, a, there's a Minnesota Department of Agriculture report on, on um, water fees and comparing us to other states. It's about nine years old at this point, but Minnesota was far above when you need those permits, far above our neighboring states. It's certainly a concern. I think in dairy, it's, it's more of a uh, not one major thing I can point to, but uh, more of a, a annoyance and death by a thousand cuts sort of a thing. We have our inspection fees. Uh, you might have a conditional use permit you need to fill out in certain counties. Uh, your township may require things. And so those are the things that um, cost is one thing, but just knowing you need to fill them out, first of all, when you're waking up and just trying to farm every day, and secondly, uh, uh, having to keep track of all of them and taking the time to do them uh, adds a lot of burden to farmers' lives. But um, those, those water fees from MPCA, I, I know based on the data that we have are, are much higher than neighboring states. Um, and then I, I think as we see pressure on um, um, the nutrients that we have on our land and the interaction with the water, we continue to see that flow down to the county level. So it's, it's certainly, when, when farmers get those, <laughs> those uh, letters in the mail, it's not their favorite day. But I, I don't have a great estimate of, of average. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, if, if you know of any place where to find some of that information, <laughs> I'd like to see something like that, a of, of, uh, condensed uh, version of what these potentially have on, on the ability to keep farming, because uh, you've already indicated that you're losing how many farmers a year, uh, and how many more, do, how far do we go before we don't have a, the a necessary amount to continue? So. Uh, I hate to see the family farm go. I hate to see uh, that thing that I grew up with, and I think there's a lot of young people that uh, are no longer farming because uh, they just can't. It's just not. I mean, why would you have a? Why would you want to go into farming with a million dollar price tag facing you like that? Uh, so, and I see that uh, on a something that's happening on a regular basis. So, but I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sosom, just uh, as an aside or an extension of Senator Anderson's commentary, uh, obviously the decline in number of dairies in the state of Minnesota has been precipitous and over some duration. So uh, his request for data, for that argument to make sense, that it's regulation that's causing the decline in dairy farm, for that to make any sense at all, we would also have to map that upon 
specific moments of increases in regulations, obviously. So clearly there's a lot more going on than just that. And one of the things that you and I have talked about is the need to develop more international trade options. Could you speak to that a little bit about opening new markets, perhaps, as something that would help out our, our Minnesota dairies? Yes. Uh, thanks, Senator Putnam. May I address the first part of your comments first, and then I'll talk Absolutely, about Absolutely, Mr. Joseph. Yeah, I think, I think the one thing to think about, farmers, farmers are really good at avoiding extra work because they have so much already. And you see very many farms in our state permitted right below where those fees start. And they talk to me that they will never go over that level because they are so afraid and don't want to touch that. So I think that's the, that's the hindrance that I want to touch on is they just avoid them altogether and it limits their business growth. But certainly every, every state's got uh, different things that they do as they extend regulation and, and point well taken. Uh, on, the, on the international market front, um, a great question. There's, there's lots we can do. Um, there's, there's certainly more ways the dairy industry can engage. We, like many commodities, have a national group called the U.S. Dairy Export Council. And so our, our own farmers' dollars, along with our companies' dollars, um, and, and that's dairy companies, uh, pair up to make sure that we can get into markets and, and stay in markets. So we do some of that work already. I know our, our Department of Agriculture uh, looks for opportunities, invites people like me and, and people from the companies to go on trips and extend those. But I think um, we just have a, a population situation here if where if we're realistic and we're going to grow the dairy market, it's gonna be outside our borders. And I think the dairy industry fully realizes that and most of our other commodities fully embrace that. And so, we can innovate here, certainly, and, and make new products, but a lot of our standard products are going to need to leave U.S. borders, and already do. Um, one of our Minnesota dairy industry's largest export partners is certainly Mexico. We're sending a lot that way, and when I say Mexico, that means it's skipping Iowa, skipping Missouri, skipping Arkansas, going straight to Mexico, uh, because we make great products here that people in other countries enjoy. Thank you very much, Mr. Sosom. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you also. I want to publicly and personally thank you for hosting us at your farm just a couple weeks ago. It was great to get the chance to visit with both you and to eat your cheese. Uh, thanks a ton for having us there, and thank you again for your testimony. Um, our next and last order of business is the Dairy Development and Profitability Enhancement Program, a presentation with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, uh, Ms. Schoenfeld and Ms. Vandermeer. Um, I, I do apologize that uh, we are going a little bit long, so if we could expedite, that would be lovely. Um, if not, cool too. But um, thank you for your perspicacity. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair and committee members, thank you for the op opportunity to speak today. I'm sorry, could you state your name yep. and uh, thank you. <laughs> I apologize. For the record, my name is Courtney Vandermeer. I am the Farm and Business Development Coordinator with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Today I have with me Cami Schoenfeld, also from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. We are speaking today on the Dairy Development and Profitability Enhancement Programs. In the late 90s, the Dairy Development and Profitability Enhancement Programs were created to help dairy farmers and improve milk prices. The program was set up under annual budget riders for over two decades. Then in 2021, the program was officially established into statute. We're required under statute to report to the legislature any outcomes and impacts from the prior year and our plans for the upcoming year. Our report from the late summer has been included in your packets, and if that is not available, please let us know and we'd be happy to provide it to you. This program consists of two primary components, the first being the dairy profitability enhancement teams. Dairy farmers in this program work with a team of dairy professionals who help them improve the success and long-term sustainability of their farms. These are referred to in statute as the dairy profitability and enhancement teams, but are more commonly known as the, simply the dairy profit teams. The second piece of this program is the dairy business planning grant. This program covers 50% of the cost to hire a third party, third party to create a business plan for the dairy operation. For fiscal years 24 and 25, the program has an annual appropriation of 634,000 per year. The commissioner has the discretion to allocate the funds between the two programs that I mentioned and for administrative costs. We've traditionally allocated $500,000 per year for the dairy profit teams and $85,000 per year for the dairy business planning grants. 
And Mr. Chair, with your permission, I'd like to turn over the presentation to Ms. Schoenfeld. Mr. Chair, my name's Cammie Schoenfeld, and I administer the Dairy Development and Profit Enhancement Programs at the MDA. Prior to coming to the MDA a little less than a year ago, I was a farm business management instructor that sat firsthand at many MDI meetings. Along with that, I am also a livestock producer in western Minnesota. The Dairy Profit Teens Grants is administered through our grant process. Beginning last summer, we moved this grant cycle from being a yearly cycle to being a two-year cycle to follow the biennium. The Minnesota Dairy Initiative, the MDI, as it's called, has been the sole recipient of that grant since its inception. But in the 24-25 cycle, we had a second grant, a smaller one, awarded to the Minnesota Milk. Going to the Minnesota Dairy Initiative grant, this is a grant that creates farm-led teams that are custom fit to, marry, to, feed, to meet the dairy farm needs. This team is often consisted of lenders, nutritionists, farm business management instructors, veterinarians, extension staff, genetic representatives, and anyone else who will come to the table to see that that farm will be successful. MDI coordinators assist this team in the selection of the team, organizing the meetings, taking, making, an agenda, making agendas, taking notes, and helping that farm set goals. They create action plans, help them implement them, and keep that team moving forward. The MDI coordinators do this along with the Sustainable Farmers Association, SFA. In 2023, there was 202 farms enrolled in Minnesota, along with SFA reaching another 22, and an overall MDI worked with 246 farms, roughly 65,000 dairy cows. On this map, you can see the regions. This includes six regions, along with the Sustainable Farming Association. There's seven regional coordinators, along with a statewide coordinator. This map is actually the 23 numbers, so it is different than what's in the legislative report. I'd like to take a minute and share a story of when I served on an MDI team. We had started with a new farm. It was two young farmers that had inherited the farm. Dad had passed away and they were in control. And we brought in, that was our first team meeting and we had lenders, nutritionists, genetic rep, and we started talking about what we can do for improvement on this farm. And admittedly, the producers knew there was lots of room for improvement. It was interesting because the thing that came out was the lender stated, your dad was a great guy, but he was not the first one in the field, probably not the second or the third, and was concerned about the quality of forages they were putting up along with the production of the crops. After some discussion and some suggestions, they hired the neighbor to actually custom farm and put in their corn earlier than it's ever been put in before. That year, they had record-breaking corn yields along with the best forage crop they'd ever had. That dramatically affected cost of production and put that farm towards being more profitable than it had, than it had seen in a long time. I still keep in contact with that family and I call that a huge success made in a few hours. Minnesota Milk was also awarded a small grant for 24 and 25. This is a different approach. They will use local teams to create legacy conservation plans. They will use, they will tap the federal, state, and local programs utilizing conservation consultants to make these plans. They will be focused in Southwest Minnesota and we're excited to see what they have to report when they finish those projects. Moving on to the Dairy Business Planning Grants. This is a grant that will pay up to 50% up to 10, on $10,000 to hire a third party consultant to work with your farm to create a plan. These, plans are, or these grants are often used to create feasibility studies of expansion, plan environmental upgrades, or create, transfer, or create strategies to transfer that family operation to the next generation or possibly new owners. It's a fairly simple application where grant, or grantees ask about, are asked about their project, the cost, and who they will be working with to create this plan. On the map, you will see this is the recipients in 2023 where we awarded 17, 
and used all the funding available that year. And as of 2024, we have 13 that we have awarded and have a limited m amount of dollars um, left. It's a first come, first serve, and we will award them based on if they meet the criteria. So if you know of anybody, please have them get a hold of us. Thank you for your time, and let us know if you have any questions. Wow, extra credit points for being so quick. Uh, <laughs> members, questions or comments? I guess we'll take some of those points, too. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, all right, folks, thanks to everyone who presented to us today. I think it was a, a lively and fascinating conversation. I think we all learned a lot. Um, our next session, uh, as you all know, is an awkward one. Uh, we'll be meeting at 9 a.m. on Monday with a joint meeting with the Environmental Environment Committee. Uh, so Monday 26 will be our next session, a presentation on nitrates in the karst region from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, MPCA, and MDH. And I want to thank Senator Westrom for uh, pointing out that uh, our opportunity to take a photo has been moved. So we're actually going to be fine. The Senate photo will be at a different time. But thank you for mentioning that, because I had no idea that was going to be an issue. So other than that, we're pretty good. Um, members, any other comments or questions? Senator Gustafson? Um, yes, thanks, Chair. Uh, which room are we in for Monday morning? This one? Here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, there being no other business for the committee, thanks a lot, guys. See you on Monday. We are adjourned. <laughs>